Hello, welcome to the Millionaire Woman Show, where we'll be discussing leadership, business, and human potential, inspiring you to live rich from the inside out, unlock your creativity, stretch out of your comfort zone, break through your barriers, take inspired action, and achieve epic results. Now, here's your host, two-time best-selling author, speaker, and certified executive coach, Deborah Kosowski. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Millionaire Woman podcast. I am super excited. I have a special guest that I actually got to first hear a couple years ago when she was receiving the Global Woman of Vision Award, and I am super excited to have her with us today. Dr. Shauna Pandya is a physician, scientist, astronaut, candidate, speaker, martial artist, and adventurer. As a scientist, astronaut, candidate with Project Possum, she has tested commercial spacesuits in microgravity and flown over 100 parabolas to date. She has served as a mission specialist for Project Possum's high altitude inoculants cloud campaign, operating tomography instrument to gather more data about the clouds, thought to be a marker of climate change. She also serves as a lead instructor for Possum's operational space medicine course, looking at medical operations and considerations for EVA scenarios. Through Project Possum, she's experienced slow onset hypoxia training, decompression chamber, aerobatic flight, undergone emergency spacecraft egress, sea survival, and helped test spacesuits in off nominal spacecraft landing scenarios. She's published book chapters on psychosocial resilience in long duration spaceflight, reproduction in long duration sp spaceflight, and space medicine spin-offs in long duration spaceflight. Dr. Pandya is currently completing her private pilot's license and holds an advanced free fall solo skydiving license and numerous scuba diving certifications including open water, advanced rescue and nitrox she holds a second degree black belt in Taekwondo and dabbles in Muay Thai, having trained in fight camps in Thailand, and she is fluent in English, French, Gurjati, and dabbles in Russian, Spanish, and Hindi. Please welcome to our show, Dr. Shauna Pandya. Thank, Thank you. you so much for joining us, and I am super excited to actually have you here um, in my living room to just talk about the advances of science and I would really like to start with what inspired you to take up space science? Uh, well first of all thank you so much for having me here today. Um, space has been a lifelong journey for me so ever since I was a kid like most other kids I wanted to be an astronaut and um, for me the dream just never went away and you can ask my junior high teachers when I would hand in assignments they would all be about how I wanted to go to space or be the director of NASA and um, I was lucky enough that um, a lot of the times uh, a lot of the times as a kid growing up my parents would really uh, foster this love um, we would go camping and see some of the most beautiful night skies in uh, in Alberta in the northwestern United States and the Milky Way galaxy would just leap out at us or we would be lucky enough to see the Leonid's meteor, meteor shower and that's really reinforced how, how much uh, of mystery and beauty and the unknown that space represented for me. Um, so that's where it all started. It really excites me because as a kid I was telling you earlier that I used to have a solarium in my room put those stickers on the ceiling and uh, growing up on a farm where there's not a lot of city lights we used to put our chairs out on the deck and watch the stars so it's fascinating to just hear of your adventures. And one of the things that I was researching was actually your Mars simulation. So tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, as you heard in my bio, I um, kind of have a dual life as a physician and scientist astronaut candidate, kind of this Batman, Bruce Wayne kind of persona. And so on the space side, on the citizen scientist astronaut candidate side, we get to do a lot of cool things. And one of them was uh, an analog stay at the MDRS or Mars Desert Re Research Station. And so um, when we talk about analog environments, um, we talk about simulated uh, space environments here on Earth. And so the simul similarities can be um, usually that they're isolated and confined and far away from the rest of civilization. 
So uh, last year, uh, about a year ago, I was lucky enough to go to the middle of the Utah desert, just outside Hanksville, USA, and spend two weeks at the Mars Desert Research Station where we lived real life on fake Mars. And basically, we lived as if we were astronauts on Mars. If we went outside our habitat, we had to don a spacesuit. So when we went on our EVAs, our extravehicular activities, we would don our spacesuits, go on our rovers, explore, um, map the train, map where we'd been, um, conduct some really cool science, uh, and then also learn to live a as a crew and function and, and uh, maximize our productivity as a crew with um, uh, a crew of five in a tin can uh, out in the middle of nowhere. So it was an incredible experience and one that I, I really learned a lot from. What is the greatest lesson that you took away from that experience? Um, a couple of them. I really learned a lot about teamwork because as you can imagine, everything we do in in space is, it's not just one person. It's not just, oh, you're an astronaut. What you Whatever you see um, when it comes to human spaceflight is the culmination of thousands of hours of work of thousands of people, um, engineers, policy makers, flight detectors, flights, or sorry, flight directors, uh, flight surgeons. And so, um, it's always, always, always team-based, and so I'm always trying to be a better teammate regardless of what, what I'm doing next. And so um, one of my teammates on that mission phrased it really succinctly when he said, the way I view my role as a teammate is, am I making my teammates' lives easier or harder? And that's something, and it was funny, I was just messaging him that earlier today that I was telling him that I still think about that every single day. So that was the first lesson. And then um, I'm really interested in psychological resilience, um, especially in extreme environments. And that's a, it's, it's a passion of mine to read about it and research it. Um, and so I was reading this book called Psychology and Human Spaceflight while we were on that mission. So it was very meta because I was, I was observing the crew dynamics of how we all interacted and then also reading about it on, on what they'd found on missions um, to the International Space Station. And one of the key takeaways I had from that is when you're dealing with conflict, there's two responses you can have. You can have emotionally oriented reactions or you can have action oriented reactions. Um, and Many of the times when we're dealing with conflict or something unpleasant, it's very, very easy to have that visceral response and deal with something that's emotional. Um, but w you, can, you can have another tactic. You can say, this, this isn't optimal. What, if, what is my action? And have an action-oriented response. So that was my second big takeaway from my time at the MDRS. So when you think of, when you talk about the reactive part, mm -hmm. the, not the emotional, is it more of an impulsive action or is it still a thought out action of what, what can I do? So one of the things I talk about a lot when I, when I give public talks is emotional intelligence. And there's all sorts of definitions out there, but simply put, it's called being the adult in the room. Um, and sometimes really realizing that that adult in the room is, has to be you. Um, and so coming back to your question, um, it's about impulse control, which is actually a key component of resilience and managing those impulses to, or knee-jerk reactions to, you know, be angry or be sad or be, be uh, you know, petulant about something that makes you unhappy and then control that impulse and instead react in a way that's productive um, to an unfavorable situation. Has there ever been a time where you had to pull on that resilience muscle where you're like, I really need to learn how to be resilient right now. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, it's, um, it's through hardship and it's through failures that I've learned to be more resilient. And it's really interesting because when we hear about the term resilience and grit and stick to itiveness and being mentally strong, I think the, the impulse for a lot of us is to think that it's something we're born with. Um, but it's, it's actually something that can be learned. And the research around uh, resilience in extreme environments shows that it can actually be broken down into five key traits, which is impulse control, which we talked about, mm -hmm. um, mental rehearsal, so preparing for both the best and the worst case scenarios, positive self-talk, telling yourself that you've got this, uh, having strong social supports, um, and then also, um, uh, you know, breaking things down, taking things step by step. When you talk about learning things from adversity, when I read your bio, I'm like, one, when did she find time to do all this and gravitate to learning, what, almost six, seven languages? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, being able to do Muay ma Thai, thai, yeah. ma thai and, you know, jump out of skydiving and, you know, all of these things. So 
what is one failure that you were able to spring back from and know that it was a valuable lesson? Yeah, um, absolutely. And so um, I used to, before I became a general practitioner, um, uh, I went, trained in neurosurgery. And for me, that was my, my, day, my, my day and my night. It was something I lived, ate, breathed and slept and it really meant a lot to me. And so um, when I made that, when I left that program, it really was this, um, this internal, this, this deep uh, introspective journey I went through because it, it, you know, this is something I'd wanted to be since I was 15. Um, and it really, it really gave me pause to think because I did feel like a failure because I didn't do what I set out uh, to do. And so um, that's actually when I started reading about resilience and learning about um, what resilience meant to me and what it, how I could build more resilience. Um, and then that was the start of it. And ever since then, every, every time I've, endure, I've encountered hardship or tried to, to um, overcome some sort of obstacle, um, I, I rem remember those five key components of resilience and you know try to pull on at least one of them to to overcome yeah and i think it's very powerful like although at that time you might have thought that i'm failing myself mm -hmm. but at the same time when i think of your path of you know from a, a small child writing writing papers or you know in school writing papers on being part of space and knowing that even though that you were doing neurosurgery mm -hmm. Your whole path led you to where you are now, being this scientist astronaut candidate. So you wouldn't have been able to continue to do that regardless, right? Yeah, that's exactly it. You know, it's um, it's like every. Sometimes you can think back on your life and look at pivotal decisions you've made. And sometimes I go through the thought experiment of wondering, you know, maybe in this, maybe there's a parallel universe in which I didn't make that decision and I'm living some other life as a surgeon. Um, or, you know, maybe there's some other multitude of journeys I could have taken. And it's, it's really fun kind of going through that thought experiment and uh, wondering where you might have ended up, but also realizing that in this universe, you're following the certain path yeah. based on the decisions you've made. And then also trusting that where you are now is where you need to be. That's absolutely right. And I think, um, I think as a corollary to that, uh, I think what I've learned a lot about uh, experiencing adversity is the, the law of two feet or the, the power that we all have. And it's something that I've learned from my dad, who's always taught me that you can't control other, other people's reactions, but you can certainly control your own. And so um, another, another way a teammate of mine once put it is um, we were dealing with a, you know, a very hard to deal with teammate. Uh, and then, you know, he just said, you know, essentially, uh, we'll call them Joe. He said, Joe is going to Joe. And, you know, it was such a simple uh, tongue-in-cheek way of putting it. But it, what he really meant was this person is going to do what they're going to do. We can't control that. We can certainly control what we're going to do about it. And so all of these lessons, the law of two feet, my dad talking about controlling our own reactions, my teammate talking about, you know, Joe is going to Joe. It just means that the world is going to happen. We can't control any of that but we can certainly control our own emotional responses and the ensuing actions. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So when we're thinking about emotions and we think about the habits that build up our successes or the discipline behind it, mm -hmm. I'm very curious about the structure because needing to learn all the languages and know all these other things of, I call them the what if scenarios because yeah. going yeah. to space, there's a lot of different things and I'm sure there's checklists and manuals yeah, for absolutely. every single thing. Absolutely. What habits have you put in place that have helped you get to where you are today? Oh, that's a great question. Um, there's so much we can talk about. And so um, before we started recording, we talked about engineering discipline into your environment. Um, and so for me, that's become really important. So um, physically engineering your environment so they have no choice but to be disciplined. And so the example I gave you was when I'm trying to get work done is putting my phone on a different level of my house so I can't access it, so I can't check my notifications or my email or whatever, or um, you know, the tool booth I have above my bathroom. So I have a pull-up bar set above my bathroom door. And so if I wanna go in, I have to do pull-ups so I can maintain, you know, maintain that upper body strength. Um, so that's two techniques, um, or those are two examples, but um, uh, other things, goal setting and checklists. So checklists run my life. Um, it's 
partially because I love the feeling of checking things off. It's very satisfying, but also, you know, looking at what needs to be done today. Um, and then asking myself what needs to be done today for, to, for today to be a good day. And so that means looking at what deadlines need to be met, but also what what I'd like to accomplish. And so on the fun side, for me, that's language lessons. So, so for example, I really, I really like Russian. Um, I'm not good at it, but I really like learning it, learning it. So I spend a few minutes every day learning it. Um, and then in the bigger picture of discipline is um, maintaining what I call a rate of scan. And so this is something I learned through my piloting and scuba diving and skydiving. And um, when you're doing any one of these activities, you're looking at your environment outside, but you're also looking at your gauges and your meters and your dashboard. Um, and you're maintaining that rate of scan between your environment and your, your dashboard um, and maybe your map as well. And you're constantly scanning. And it's the same as if you're driving a car. So if you're driving a car, you're looking in the rear view mirror, you're looking at your dashboard, you're looking outside. Um, and the whole bottom line is, where are you in relation to where you want to be? Um, and where are you in relation to where you've been? And so goal setting is the exact same. So you set your long term goals, um, but then you set your immediate term goals. So what needs to be done today? Your short term goal, goal, your short term goals, and then your intermediate term goals. And then you constantly flip your rate of scan between all of those, the long term, short term, immediate term um, and uh, intermediate term. Uh, and you're looking at, you know, how does what I'm doing with these short term goals compare to the long term goals? And then you make your rate of scan. Uh, so you you are essentially are asking yourself, where am I in relation to where I want to be? Do you ever catch yourself procrastinating or getting caught by the bright, shiny object? Oh, absolutely. And that's why, that's exactly why I have so much to say about discipline because I need it. It's, um, it's not like, oh, you know, I have 17 things to do, so I'm going to sit down and do them. I absolutely procrastinate. And that's exactly why I have to, um, you know, come up with these systems. So for example, my morning routine is the exact same thing. Um, there's three things for me that I need to make my morning set so that the rest of the day goes well and one is preparation the night before so having everything i need for the the um the morning so whether that's my gym clothes or you know making my lunch for the next day um the second thing is efficiency so putting my things in the same place and then economizing the movement that i need to do in the morning so i'm not looking for things and then the third thing is coffee because <laughs> coffee is amazing <laughs> I don't drink coffee myself, but I do like caffeine. I love, I love caffeine. <laughs> it keeps us going. Definitely, Absolutely. Yeah. Definitely. So one of the other things that I was thinking about, you know, since both women and, uh, and not that men don't listen to our show or watch our show, but I'm really curious about, you know, as being a woman and a minority in the field, mm -hmm. really, mm -hmm. what things have you done or put in place to inspire I know as a role model for sure, but are there other things that you've done to inspire women to pursue space science or medicine or or different things like that? Yeah, absolutely. And this is something my my teammates and I have discussed amongst ourselves. Um, my female teammates and I have um, discussed amongst ourselves uh, because for us, you know, when we were we were kids, we we didn't think, oh, you know, I'm I'm the underdog, I'm the lesser represented one. We just thought, hey, this is what we want to do. Yeah. Um, and my, my perspective never changed until um, I started doing what I'm doing now and um, started you know, giving public talks. And I remember one, one event in particular, I was giving a talk to um, some science and uh, some STEM undergrads, so science, technology, engineering, medicine. And this, this first or second year undergrad girl came up to me afterwards and she was Southeast Asian as well. And she said, seeing someone like you up there with the same background as me makes me realize that I can do this. And that was the first time I realized how much representation matters. Um, and so, you know, the, the internal philosophy that I've adopted, whether it's in medicine, whether it's in space or whatever, even martial arts is, um, how can I make it better? And then how do I do that? And the question that you might ask is why does it matter? And it absolutely does because, um, I think so, mon so many of us underestimate our, our self-worth and we think, okay, I can handle this, this injustice or this, this, this mistreatment or whatever. And then we think, okay, it's fine. But what about the next person? They may not be able to handle that. And it's not fair to leave an environment that is suboptimal for in which people uh, cannot perform at their best 
uh, when you have an opportunity to change that. So if I, if I see something um, that's not optimal, uh, whether it, if it's a work environment, I, I'm, I note how it, it's not suboptimal and then I ask how can I make it better and then I take steps to make it better. And it, and it relates back to that teamwork because it's not just the team that you're with, everyone around you is kind of like part of a team where how can I make it better for that next person. That's so true. And it's, um, you know, I'm a graduate of the uh, University of Alberta and their motto is um, uplifting the whole people. And I really take that to heart because, um, you know, if you, if you have a team, you're only as strong as your weakest team member. And so if you're not creating an environment in which everyone can perform, then you're not doing what's best for your team. So it's, it's in your best interest, even if you, if you ignore the, the human aspect of it, the compassionate aspect of it. But, you know, if you look at just the metrics, if you set everyone else up to succeed and to perform at their best, then you're doing your team the most justice. Yeah. One of the other things that we were talking about earlier is also about raising the bar. I think people get to a point of complacency or they want to fall into mediocrity as well just because they don't want to stand out from the crowd or what will other people say. Mm -hmm. what, are, what are your thoughts on when we talk about raising the bar? Do, do we just push to do the... I was very excited when she was talking about pull-ups because <laughs> one of my greatest accomplishments for myself was being able to do one on assisted pull-ups and then I hear that you do three sets of 15 before going to the bathroom and I'm like, I have some work to do, right? It's time to raise the bar a little bit higher. So I'm curious as to what your thoughts are on that continuous improvement. Oh, absolutely. You know, we can always do better. Um, and you know, there's a way, there's a way to be hard on yourself in a way that's destructive and a way that's productive. And so, um, you know, I always talk, frame it as pushing the limits and, you know, some people might say, but why, like, why do you do that? Why, why jump out of a plane? Why skydive or why do all this space stuff? And it's, it's the same as whether you're testing materials as in stress testing as an engineer. It's the same as whether you're going to the gym and lifting weights. Like, why are you pushing to lift more? Why are you pushing that material until it breaks? It's A, to know where that limit is but it's B to strengthen that material or strengthen your own muscles so you can go further the next time. And it really hit home for me when I was at the Mars Desert Research Station. We would go on these amazing scenic EVAs in our spacesuits and we would climb up these really steep, silty, hard to climb up peaks and mountains and it wasn't easy. But then we'd get to the top and then we would see these amazing expanses ahead of us and if we hadn't bothered to push our own limits we wouldn't know the beauty of what lay up there we wouldn't know where the next path was and what lay to explore next um, and we wouldn't know just how much more there was to discover and it's the same with with anything when, when we're talking about pushing the limits why why push why explore why discover to to know our own limits um, to go further the next time to see what comes next it's very interesting because there, there's times where I hear people say, why do you do that? And, I, and the one answer that always comes to me is because I can. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's, it's partially because we can. Um, but also I think it's a lot, a lot of it, it comes down to character. Like why it's, you know, our, our character is just like that muscle. It's just like that, that material that we're stressing. We test our own character to find out where our own limits are and to make ourselves better. What's possible? Exactly. Yeah. No, I love that. I could talk with you all day long. <laughs> um, so another question that comes to mind is, so we've talked about discipline, we've talked about habits, we've, we've um, talked about pushing those limits and continuous improvement. What is a book that you've been reading for your own improvement? Oh gosh, um, there's so many that I can recommend. The one I'm reading now is called 13 Things um, mentally strong people oh, don't do. That. Yeah. And, um, you know, some, some things are self-evident, but there's always a portion of the book that says, okay, I'm not doing that. I could do that better. Um, you know, it talks about a lot of the things we've talked about already, you know, self-empowerment, not giving your power away. Um, and you know, there's always, there's always little gems in there. Even if you're at the top of your game and you're doing, you're really successful, like, like we were just been talking about, you can always do better. Mm -hmm. And so that's the one I'm in the middle of now. Um, and then two other books I really like, um, Chris Hatfield, of course, he had to come up, uh, An Astronaut's Guide to Earth. He, I, I quite enjoyed that book and, you know, his journey to being an astronaut. Um, and then coming back to the whole resilience, um, there's one by an ex-Navy SEAL called Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willink. Mm. 
Um, and I, I really uh, like the insights about leadership and again, owning every situation that you're in and realizing that regardless of how dire the situation is, you have some power to act. Um, so I think those are my top three recommendations yeah. right now. Well, I have some more for you. Oh, <laughs> I sure. don't know well, if you've already read um, Unbeatable Mind by Mark Devine. No, I heard and of it. The Way of the Seal. So he's been a guest on my show oh, before, and I like to study mental toughness. So yes, I, have to, yeah. I have to read the extreme ownership. So I think you'd really like it. Yeah. You know, it has some really valuable insights. Yeah. Because yeah. when I think about resilience and I think about, you know, going into space, you would have to have that mental toughness or even just doing the pull up, right? To develop that toughness is this is what I'm going to do because how easy would it be just to run into the bathroom? Yeah, you know, and it's, it's so easy to say, oh, you know, I can do this tomorrow. I can do this next time. I can hit snooze one more time. Yeah. Um, but when you, when you make habits that you strengthen yourself, you're setting yourself up for success and to do, do even more and go even further. So when you think of people making a commitment versus being interested, what sets them apart? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, so I think it's, I think it's the, the follow-up because, you know, having been through so many different life experiences and, you know, part of groups that start things and, and projects, um, I think, I think one of the best pieces of advice, so this, this goes way back to my Silicon Valley days when I was running a startup um, and I was talking to another CEO um, uh, and she said, you know, as I was asking her, how can I help you with uh, uh, your venture? She said, one of the most valuable things I've learned is not just asking, how can I help, but looking for things to do um, and just filling in the gaps. and. For me, that's something I've really observed in great leaders, and I call it the mortar between the bricks, because the strength of a brick wall doesn't come from the bricks, even though they look like the toughest, strongest part of the wall, but it comes from the mortar between the bricks, um, because without the mortar, the, bricks would, the brick wall would just fall apart. And so when I think about leadership, um, and coming back to your question about commitment, um, it's about filling in those gaps, looking for what needs to be done. And even when I look at my experiences as a scientist astronaut candidate, what some of the greatest lessons I've learned about being a teammate are from teammates of mine who just look for things to be done or who, who have literally gone up to, to other teammates saying, my hands are empty, yours are full, give me something to carry. Like they, they, don't, they don't just say, oh, you know, give me a task. They're not, they're not very passive about it. They're very assertive and say, okay, this needs to be done. I see a gap, I'm gonna fill it. And so the, coming back to commitment and interests, commitment shows, okay, there's something that needs to be done. I have time, I'm gonna do it. I think what's powerful in that is the assertiveness of I'm part of this team and I need to help carry the load. And I think in teams, if we saw that more often versus that's their job. Absolutely, right? absolutely. And it's like, um, even in medicine, um, you know, really, you, you really, rely on your team, whether it's your senior, senior junior residents, your attending staff physician, your nurses, your unit clerk, like there's always something to be done. And you know, if you know, if you have a few spare seconds, you may as well help out. And um, you know, I've seen, I've seen attending physicians, you know, they have extra time. So they're the ones who are taking the, the chlorhexidine wipes and wiping down the bed after an OR because you know, they have the time and just doing that act is one step closer to the next door and everyone getting home on time. Yeah, and that's the power of a true team, right? Exactly, You're just looking for gaps to be filled in. So when you think of leadership, what are three characteristics that you think make a great leader? Oh gosh, um, there's so many, but I think um, vision, action, and selflessness. And so seeing the big picture being able to put that into an executable plan and then also realizing it's not about you at all. And one of my best friends from, from my time in Silicon Valley, she's a CEO and she just said, my job is just to make sure that everyone has the resources they need so they can do theirs. And it's not, it's not about being the tip of the spear. It's not about being the head of the boardroom. Yeah. It's about being the one who maximizes the opportunities and the environment for the rest of the team to perform at their best. So that vision piece, when you thought about going into space and thinking about your vision, what is the vision you see for yourself for the next three years? 
Oh gosh, there's so much that I want to do and so much that's coming up that's going to be really exciting. Um, so um, their uh, exploration isn't, is, is, there's so much out there to do. So not just space exploration, but uh, ocean exploration. Um, really uh, being a leader in extreme environment medicine. Um, really doing anything I can to um, promote both human spaceflight as well as the operational space medicine aspect of spaceflight because space is trying to kill you and um, we need to do everything we can to if we're planning on sending people to the moon and Mars of making sure we're optimizing them to be not just healthy but productive in an environment that's high radiation, low gravity and far away from Earth. That's very intense <laughs> projection. Do you have any personal challenges that you've set up for yourself that you want to accomplish in the next, like are you going to learn on that add to the language list or is there something else that you want to do? Oh gosh, there's so much. Um, so completing my private pilot's license, um, definitely that's been a long time coming. Uh, getting back into the water, it's been a while since I've gone scuba diving, getting back in the air, um, going for my next scuba diving certification and then I've taken a hiatus from martial arts so just getting back into that so those are the the personal um, goals but you know it, there's there's so much I want to do in so little time that I would uh, you know give me give me hours and I'll, I'll give you a long laundry list of things that I will be doing in the next few years but what I sense is that you go back to home some of the things that you already have right absolutely and um, even even if things are going well and I'm performing as I want to it comes back to pushing the limits like there's been times when you know I've been able to work out every day seven days a week but I just feel like I've hit a plateau. And so then, you know, it comes down to really sharpening the focus and saying, how do I do more? And in my more extreme moments, I've set up 30 day challenges that have been really, really limit pushing and saying, can I do 10,000 push ups in 30 days? Um, you know, can I, you know, set out these running, weightlifting, uh, cardio goals? Can I do this in 30 days? Um, so there's, there's always goals to be met. <laughs> And there's always ways to personally challenge yourself if you feel like you've hit a plateau. Absolutely. Like even, even with Russian, I felt like I was improving in my comprehension, but with the synthesis is something where I really struggled. And so then I thought, okay, why don't I just start thinking in Russian, you know, or why don't I just start looking at things that I, I would say normally and try translating that into Russian to work on the synthesis aspect. So, um, I think where that translates into goal setting is learning to be a bit meta and learning to um, take a step back and then say, evaluate yourself very um, uh, dispassionately and say, okay, where could I, where could I do better? Mm -hmm. So obviously my background is nursing. So as a physician, you, you can't have that necessarily fake it till you make it. No, <laughs> that wouldn't go well. <laughs> and I've never... I've never believed that there's that true fake it till you make it, but there's also a difference between act as if, right? To have that act as if I'm confident in this role, mm -hmm. act as if I'm that physician mm -hmm. already, mm -hmm. and it's not that you don't have have the knowledge already, but it's how would I have to act to be successful at this level? Yeah, and there's so many ways to think about that. Um, I uh, there was one podcast with a a. Navy SEAL that I was listening to and he said, you know, um, look at, uh, look at, to, to define your, your future career path, look at someone at, a, at your level and who performs as you would like to perform, pick someone one level ahead of you and then pick someone at the most senior level and like that you can view as role models and then, you know, look at what behaviors they have that you think you can do better in and emulate them. Um, the the way I look at it is um, w one of the things that I think we all deal with is the imposter syndrome, not feeling as if we're good enough, not feeling as if we've done enough, like wondering if we belong there with the rest of our colleagues. And actually once, I, I recently gave a talk a, a week or two ago and asked the room, like who here has never felt the imposter syndrome? Nobody raised their hand. And so we all deal with it, but we don't have to. I think if we dissect it, if we're surgical about it and take a more constructive approach and say, okay, what is it that I'm feeling? What is it that I specifically think that I'm not good at? Is it that I think that I don't um, execute well enough? Do I not read enough? Is my knowledge base on X not enough? You know, be very specific about it and then ask yourself, is there merit to it? Um, 
If no, then tell that voice to shut up and move on. And then if yes, you know, make a plan for addressing that so you can be better. Um, so there's a way to even take negatives like that imposter syndrome mm -hmm. and use it to your advantage to be, be more productive. Versus dwelling on it. Absolutely. That's not productive. Um, you know, feeling like you're, you don't belong or feeling like, you know, you'd rather be doing something else with your life is not productive. But asking yourself, okay, what would I rather be doing? And is that a better option for me um, based on my goals and my values? Um, that's a lot more productive. Yeah. Mentorship. Oh gosh, I have so many, uh, and it's I actually make it a point to talk about it when I'm when I'm giving my public talks because I wouldn't be where I am if a lot of people who didn't have to um, took the time to invest in me all throughout my career, and so it's a it's a matter of environment of my family, my friends, and you know professional colleagues who invested in me when they didn't have to. Um, so, for example, um, before this podcast, we were talking about how during my final year of medical school, I was lucky enough to be selected by the Canadian Space Agency to be one of two medical students sent down to NASA's Johnson Space Center to do an aerospace medicine clerkship. And um, uh, this was during the time when David St. Jacques and Jeremy Hansen, uh, Canada's two newest astronauts, were down there. And of course, Chris Hadfield was training to go up to be commander of the ISS. Uh, the International Space Station. And during our briefing, the CSA, the Canadian Space Agency, they said, okay, all the Canadian astronauts that are down there, you know, we'll try to make sure they have time to liaise with you. And you're thinking, that's very nice of you to say, but they're astronauts. They have better things to do than talk to medical students. And every single one of them, they, they took time. You know, David St. Jacques took us sailing and taught us to sail. Jeremy Hansen gave us a walking tour of Johnson Space Center. Chris Hatfield, you know, took us for coffee and just talked about our goals. And they didn't have to do that. And they were just the nicest, most, you know, ironically down to earth people that you could imagine. Um, and there were so many other astronauts um, from NASA and from the European Space Agency that did that. Um, likewise, my medical school, you know, they could have been very, very strict and very firm and said, you are missing a lot of school to be able to do these amazing space opportunities. And, you know, we, it's really deviates from your schedule. And at other med schools, it could have been a professionalism, professionalism issue. And they actually went and took the extra step and said, we're going to let you rearrange your fourth year schedule so you can do this. Um, so at doesn't go unnoticed to me that a lot of the success I have today is because a lot of people moved mountains to make that happen. Um, and a lot of my success comes from the fact that people didn't have invested time in me when they didn't have to. And so I'm really cognizant of that. And so I really, I really believe in paying it forward. And I really urge my audiences to pay it forward because regardless of um, what stage of your career you're at, someone is looking up to you and someone is watching you and you know someone's being you as a role model even if you're you know you know you're in high school and you're in grade 12 you know the 10th grade is looking up to you um so someone is viewing you as a role model and so i really firmly believe in in paying it forward um as to mentorship how um i view that is a lot of the time, you know, people will say, will you take me on as a mentee? Can you be my mentor? And I actually, I don't like that approach because it becomes very nebulous because then you say, oh, so-and-so is my mentor. And sometimes you rely more on the name of that relationship. Whereas for me, I really want it to be constructive. And so I say, just send me your question and I will answer it. And so that's more productive and constructive in my view, because then it forces the mentee to think about their own goals, their own career path, and what they want to achieve for themselves. And then that's a very specific way in which you can help them. So I don't really believe in having the name mentor relationship as I do in having very specific questions. So the next question I have for you is, considering all the things you want to accomplish, how do you keep that work-life balance, but also maintain some boundaries? Because I'm sure you have many demands on your time as well. Absolutely. Um, so uh, looking at how I get things done is it comes down to, you know, prioritizing, realizing um, what my values are. And so some of the most valuable exercises that I've found for myself are listing my values and then looking at how that reflects my actions and my, you know, the, the career path which I follow. And so one of my friends really phrased it well when he said, my New Year's resolution is to take a look at who I am, 
how others perceive me, how I, who I want to be, and how I want to be perceived. And then examine the gap between all those things and try to minimize that gap. And so for me, the way I do that is looking at my values versus my actions and looking at do my actions reflect my values. And for me, those values are really um, exploration, discovery, um, loyalty to those who matter to me, compassion, intellectual pursuit, um, and then just having a really strong work ethic. And then I really try to bring that through in everything that I do. Um, the other way um, I look at how I conduct myself is I've taken the time out to write a code of conduct for myself because we do that as professionals. Certainly there's a code of conduct um, that all physicians abide by. There's a code of conduct that all professionals abide by, but we don't think about, you know, what we as individuals, how we want to comport ourselves. And so, um, you know, we often find ourselves disappointed with the way we've acted, but why is that? And it's because it's, there's this, um, this uh, dissonance between who we are, who our values are, and the way we've acted. So taking the time to, to make that concrete and write that down has been very helpful for me. So what are the things you include in a personal code of conduct? I think everyone's different. For me, um, you know, behaving with integrity, working really, really hard, um, you know, making sure that I'm an ideal teammate and, and family member and friend, um, and also looking at places where I could do better because um, recently, you know, I've just kind of been auditing myself, saying, where can I do better? And I think one thing I do is just take for granted all the cool things I get to do in medicine and science and these adventures. And just for me, they're, they're really fun. And so, you know, I convey that through pictures, but I also don't convey the importance of the knowledge or the science behind that. And I don't, I, I think I could do a better job of educating. And so I think that's my next step is, that's in my code of conduct. I, I have a duty to educate others, but I, I really need to do a better job of that. So it also lets me see what, where I could be doing better with my, my own actions. I really love that. I'm gonna have to go <laughs> and write my own personal code of conduct and add in that. I, and I really loved the intellectual pursuit. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so one of the things is when, when you feel that the going is getting tough or just even to set or prime your day, do you have a specific mantra that you say to yourself? So what are the things you include in a personal code of conduct? I think everyone's different. For me, um, you know, behaving with integrity, working really, really hard, um, you know, making sure that I'm an ideal teammate and, and family member and friend, um, and also looking at places where I could do better. Because um, recently, you know, I've just kind of been auditing myself, saying, where can I do better? And I think one thing I do is just take for granted all the cool things I get to do in medicine and science and these adventures. And just for me, they're, they're really fun. And so, you know, I convey that through pictures, but I also don't convey the importance of the knowledge or the science behind that. And I don't, I, I think I could do a better job of educating. And so I think that's my next step is, that's in my code of conduct. I, I have a duty to educate others, but I, I really need to do a better job of that. So it also lets me see what, where I could be doing better with my, my own actions. I really love that. I'm going to have to go and write my own personal code of conduct and add in that. And I, and I really loved the intellectual pursuit. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things is when, when you feel that the going is getting tough or just even to set or prime your day, do you have a specific mantra that you say to yourself? Gosh, yeah. Um, I think I think there's maybe about five points to that, and you know they've come from different people, and they've come from also myself. Um, and so two of them I've talked to you about is um, you know realizing that certain things are out of your control. So realizing that Joe is going to Joe. So um, but you also have the power to uh, control how you act. So the, you know you always have control of your own actions. So that's the first two. Um, and then when things are really, really rough, like there is, there's three components you can strip things down to. And one of my friends really once just put it beautifully. She just said one foot in front of the other. And that's true whether you are trying to do something monumental, something big, something ambitious, or you're just going through a rough time, one foot in front of the other, whether you're packing up your house, whether you're going through a divorce, whether you're, you know, creating a scheme for yourself to become an astronaut one step at a time. It's, it's like the old adage. How do, you eat an, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Uh, then the other thing is one, something my mom once said to me when I was going through a really rough time. And she, she just said, like, I was, I honestly thought, 
you know, the world is ending and I, I couldn't see past what was going on. And then she just said to me, like, you have to be strong. And at the time I was like, how can you say that? My world is, my world is ending. Yeah. Uh, and I, th I often think back to it because, you know, in your, regardless of what you're going through, you can find the personal fortitude. If you're still breathing, if you still have a pulse, you can find the personal fortitude to, to start digging out of this mess, even if it means digging up. Uh, and then the other thing is just seeing reality for what it is. And so one thing I've learned to say to myself is, this is my reality now. Nothing's going to change that. You can't say, you can't say I'm going to keep wearing rose-colored glasses, I'm going to put sugar-coated icing on this. Um, this is my reality. And you just accept it. And then accepting it lets you be in the moment and create a plan for going forward. Right, so you're not focused on what's behind you, the past. Exactly. And you can't change it. It's not productive. No. And the future, people often get anxiety about the future because they don't know there's that uncertainty that they're faced with. Absolutely. I love that. So just focusing on, on the present. So we've come to the end of the interview. What would be three things that you would like our audience to take away from your, your conversation today? Oh gosh, <laughs> there's so much. Um, I think really, uh, you know, there's, there's so much inside all of us uh, that we have, you know, we can offer the world. And so figure out what that is and then, you know, really work really, really hard to, to develop whatever it is that you want to focus on. Um, so develop a really good work ethic. Um, realize your duty to, to others, to pay it forward, because regardless of who you are or where you are in life, you wouldn't be here if not for the grace and the good actions of others. Uh, and then pay it forward. So, you know, I think it just comes down to um, work hard, be grateful, pay it forward. Awesome. So, Dr. Shauna Pandya, how can people stay in touch with you or learn where your whereabouts are or what you're up to? Oh, sure. Um, so maybe to, to learn my whereabouts, maybe you need a tracking chip because I'm <laughs> everywhere. Um, but you can find me online, shawnapandia.com, S-H-A-W-N-A-P-A-N-D-Y-A.com. I'm on social media, so I'm on Instagram and Twitter at Shauna Pandia, and then I have an official Facebook page, Dr. Shauna Pandia. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much for joining us on the Millionaire Woman Show. Um, I'm grateful to have had you here to have a more in-depth conversation because I know when you got the award, we didn't get a chance to have a personal connection, so I really do appreciate it. And I look forward to sharing you with our audience. Thank you so much for making the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us on the Millionaire Woman Show. We hope that you've been inspired and please share this podcast with other people so that they can raise their bar, push their limits, and also strive for greater success in where, whatever they're adventuring off into. You can go over to my website at www.debrakazowski.com to sign up for the 21 Habits High Achievers Kick to Achieve Success. As well, go over to iTunes, give us a five-star high five, write us a review. We would love to get more people listening in to this podcast and sharing the content that we have for you. As Muhammad Gandhi said, be the change you wish to be in the, see in the world. And my wish for you as always is go out and make today great.